to the monthly Utah Children's Care Coordination Network meeting. We're so glad to have you all here today. Um, we're really excited about some of the content and presentation we have for you also today. Uh, and so we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, as always, this is a Zoom meeting, so we encourage you to, as much as possible, share your face with us on camera, um, if that's an option. And then also, um, as part of our uh, welcome and introductions, I'll, I'll walk you through how to add your name um, to the chat. So our agenda today looks um, pretty similar to how it always does. We're going to have some announcements, welcome and introduction announcements and updates. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time on our monthly case share and brainstorming. And then our main topic presentation for this month is uh, around motivational interviewing. Um, with a specific focus on how to work, um, how to apply motivational interviewing in diverse communities. So we're really excited about that. And then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for some networking questions wrap up at the end of the meeting as well. So since we are on Zoom, we would love to have you add a little more details to your profile um, in Zoom, which you can do by clicking, there's like a little, this little ellipses button if you scroll to where you can see your photo uh, and you can click on that and then you should be able to rename yourself and you can put your name in there, your title um, or role that you have and your place of work would be really helpful for us to get to know each other. And as this is a Zoom meeting and we wanna encourage as much interaction as possible. So also feel free to use the chat. Um, if you have questions that come up during the presentations, um, if you want to raise, use the little raise hand icon, go ahead and do that. Or if you just want to unmute yourself and talk, we also welcome that as well. We're pretty um, casual here. We want to encourage as much interaction as possible, even though we're kind of in the Zoom setting. Although I see Eric's group is actually in person, which is great. <laughs> All right, so I'll give everybody just a second to go ahead and update your um, names and then we're going to jump into the announcements. So as always, we want to remind you that the SPARC study is still ongoing. This is one of the um, largest efforts in the United States to collect genetic information around um, autism and it's it's free to enroll. Um, all the testing is done for free. And so there's some contact information there. Sparkforautism.org slash Utah is for our, the Utah, um, the local project for this. It's like I said, it's a nationwide study, but there is a, a local Utah contact there. And then also our pediatric um, echo series through the University of Utah. Here's the Rest of the fall schedule, we're almost wrapped up with the fall series. But again, these just to remind you, we'll make sure we send out the registration link in the meeting notes as well, but they are open to anyone and CME is also available. So um, there are some great features, um, presentations left for the rest of fall. And then I know as always, there's usually a full lineup of things for winter as well. So we'll make sure that you guys are able to see that winter schedule um, at our next meeting. And for the uh, medical home portal updates, we've had some great content updated over this last month. So here's just a little brief overview of some of the clinical and families content that's been updated. And again, we send out all these links in our meeting notes. So no need to like furiously write or anything like that, but just so you're aware if any topic catches your mind, be sure to look for it, uh, the link for it in the notes that will go out um, after the meeting. All right, so today we're going to try to do, um, we've been started talking about what we want to have uh, UCCCN topics look like for 2024. So we need some help from everyone on this meeting. And um, Michelle's gone ahead and launched. We have a little bit of a poll today for some topics that we just started brainstorming. And we'd love to know, again, kind of rank your interest in these topics from not interested at all to very interested. Um, and uh, go ahead and take a few moments to kind of answer those. 
And then we also have a option for you to write in um, some topics as well on that second question. If, if none of these topics look interesting to you. <laughs> and if you also in that, in that second question, um, in the, because since it's an open field, if you have a topic that's either listed above and or one that you've thought of that would be interesting to you and also have any presenters in mind or people you would really love to hear from, we would also love that feedback. Um, sometimes it's, we can think of really great topics, but then it's a little bit harder for us to identify somebody who would be really great to present for this group to that topic. So we would just love any feedback that you guys have about those topics uh, for 2024 and any uh, presenters as well. So I'm just going to give everybody like a minute to um, respond to that poll before we move on. All right, why don't we go ahead and close it, Michelle? Thank you. And we'll be sure and look through those um, topics and try to provide you with uh, responses to our uh, presentation content for the meeting that aligns with those responses. So thank you for your for your input there. Um, so the next portion of our meeting is our case share and brainstorming and Marie Maria Soder from the Sandy Center so graciously agreed to do our case share today, but I see that she's not on our meeting. <laughs> yeah, just she, she'll be on about nine, she said. Okay. I, I think we thought we had a little bit more time for her. Okay. <laughs> Good. Well, we'll, we'll go ahead and come circle back to her, but for the moment, we want to um, open up the meeting to all of you. This is your time to talk about opportunity or any cases you want to discuss, questions you're having, barriers, new resources you've heard of, um, any updates or ideas. This is your your time, so get get ready to unmute and talk here. <laughs> and again, you can just unmute yourself and start talking. You can put something in the chat. You can use the raise hand feature, however you uh, want to proceed. A very quiet group today. <laughs> this is Dora from Shriners. Thanks, Dora. <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, give a reminder that um, it took a little bit for Shriners to restart the prenatal um, tours um, at Shriners for the Clubfoot Clinic, but it's up and running. I mean, it's been running for the full year, but just a reminder, the way that clinic works, if there's any child that has, that, you know, has been diagnosed with club feet, um, or I, so the visits I go into maternal fetal medicine, um, I go into the NICU and, uh, OBGYN offices, but if there is a child that's for some reason, wasn't able to have access to that and the child has club feet. Um, we have two locations, one at Primary Children's um, in Riverton. And when that shifts over to Lehigh, that clinic's going to shift to Lehigh because that's Dr. Hennessy. Um, and she sees all of her patients at uh, Shriners. But if there's anyone that wants to stay with primary children's, that clinic is offered through a primaries, but our provider as well. And Athena, I will have a flyer updated and I will give that to you so that you can update that if that's all right with you. Um, it'll be at the end of the year, but you're getting the pre-information <laughs> stuff. That's great. So this yeah. is a, a prenatal tours that allow um, 
people to come in and yeah so if there's a parent that wants to come in before they even set up an appointment um they can contact that number and it'll go directly to the club uh, clinic coordinator. They can ask any questions. We have packets that we can leave with your clinic and it has all the details, everything, the process of treatment. Um, I know it can be a little nerve wracking for families when they find out that their child has club feet, but that's, we have the largest club foot clinic in the West uh, West North part of the United States at Shriners. Um, so that it's nice because we work side by side by orthotics, orthotics department, they work together. So once they're done with the casting, they do the Ponsetti method, but once they're done with the casting, the first six weeks, then they'll go into bracing. And that's when they work united with orthotics department. as they grow so quick, then they give them the correct bracing they don't have to go anywhere else. They work together in this under the same roof. So that's really nice. Um, and all that information is in those packets. So if anybody would like any of those packets, you can send me a little message and I can deliver some. We have them in English and Spanish. If they want to have a tour before that and meet the provider there, um, it's something that's complimentary. Um, we give them a little tour of how the Clubfoot Clinic works. Um, if they want more information besides what it's already provided to them at your clinic and after they talk to the care coordinator, that's also an option that we offer the, the parents. Great. Thank you so much, Dora. Thank you. <clears throat> Who else would like to share something? Again, it can be an announcement, a resource, <clears throat> a difficult case you have a question on. Yes, Tony, go ahead. Um, I just want to talk about some barriers that I'm having. Um, and it's just, I don't know if there's anything. I think it's just barriers that have been around for a long time. Um, but rent assistance is a big one right now that I'm having a lot of difficulty with. Um, and also yesterday I had a case, um, a team meeting with DCFS worker on a family that is looking for some like respite care and that's always kind of a tricky a tricky situation as well so if anybody has any suggestions um for that besides you know just the housing authority that's years out <laughs> antonia hi it's maria soder um are you familiar with have you ever heard of project connection i have not Oh my gosh. Um, I can put their phone number in the chat. Okay. So Project Connection is um it's a respite program. Um, they are amazing. Um, I will give you the direct person's number. I don't know the age, ages of the children that you're it, what are the ages of the children? Um he's uh seven. Oh, perfect. They I believe their respite is um five and above and it's a it's an amazing facility they offer therapy they offer um, a game room they are just basically what you what you just said respite care for the family to go and and drop off their child in a very safe nurturing loving environment um but if that's okay i'll put the i'll put it in the chat is that okay yes please do oh yeah wonderful wonderful connection i think it would be really good okay thank you appreciate it you're welcome Maria, hi, this is Heather Carlson. Do you, is this statewide? Is this in like Salt Lake? What is the location for this website? Yes, it's this a, program? Oh, it's amazing. It's a nonprofit and it's been around for three years and it's located um, in Utah and it's, it's south, it's located southwest of, of um, so if oh, you're like Valley? Wasatch to Will, what's that? In West Valley. Yes, it's in West Valley, uh huh, and um, like I said, they've been they've been operating for about three years. Um, they're they're just incredible. So I just put the project connection, the phone number in the chat. Awesome, thank, thank you, you so much. That's a perfect location for this family. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Uh huh. I just brought up the listing we have for them on the the medical home portal as well too. So we'll be sharing like that in the 
in the notes. Um, anybody else have any resources for Tony around rent assistance or respite? Has anybody had any um, success with the Rotary program? Tony, this is Eric. What what are your usual um, roads you follow for um, rent assistance or trying to you know keep folks in stable housing? I know things have changed a lot post COVID, and you know there's not as much leniency or folks don't have as many rights for eviction. Um, what I mean, what is your typical route you know to try to keep folks you know in housing for rent? Um... Yeah, there really isn't anything anymore. What did you do? What did you do previously? Previously, it was the the COVID, um, the rent assistance. And pre-COVID, again, there was a dearth. There was nothing yeah. to help. Okay. Yeah, there wasn't really. Um, I actually don't remember. Um, I feel like there was something, uh, but I don't remember right now. <laughs> hey, Tone, I know the Salvation Army, and I know we're up north. We're, Tony and I are located in the ogden Layton area, um, and we can't, if you're in northern Utah, you can't go through the northern Utah Salvation Army, but you can go to the Salt Lake one and help a family apply for utility and rental assistance. Okay. Maybe that will help. I I think that and this family lives in Salt Lake, so I'll I'll look into that. I think um this is going to become more and more com common for us working with families because of yeah. uh, the COVID um assistance gone and then the number of families that are on wait lists. And so I think I don't know if we want to add this like kind of like a ongoing topic that we can share information because like I hadn't thought of Rotary um, uh, for, you know what I mean? Like just to jog our memories and bring, you know, bring each other back to what's available. It's just um, every single family we've worked with in the last little bit has asked this question. Mm -hmm. Well, Rotary, um, it Rotary does not help with rent. Um, they will help with other things, but you kind of need to show the proof of like um, they could help with like a utility bill. You'd have to show your bill to them um, or like if you're needing some kind of appliance um, or some, you know, equipment for uh, like a wheelchair or, you know, something like that. So they'll do other things, but not the rent part. So that's, and, and I was trying to get assistance for this family. Um, and so that's why I was wondering kind of if anybody's had any luck with them and kind of how they went about getting, you know, this, the assistance with the Rotary program. Tony, um, and I know this is, you've probably already, already gone down this road, but I am, what about any sort of faith-based group? Are these, is this a religious family at all? Do they go to any, are they part of any sort of a congregation? I mean, I know a lot of times just like local congregations or even, um, you know, an overarching uh, uh, like, like diocese or stake or, you know, ward or something like that will sometimes pay some rent on a, you know, even on an ongoing basis. Um, we did talk about that, but she's not, um affiliated with any religion okay. um she was going to talk with somebody about the local um uh, the bishop in the area but um i'm i'm not sure how that she, that was going to be like the next thing i was going to ask her so i don't know how that's going for her so far all right thanks everybody Thanks, Tony. Um, really good, really good questions. And um, 
uh, like you said, Carrie, just good to bring up these topics and remind ourselves about what resources are out there. So I think, that, again, this is just the, the value of bringing this group together every month to see what everybody's working on. Um, um, and as if, if anybody has any resources that come up to your mind during the rest of the meeting, again, feel free to pop those in the chat and we'll make sure and include them in the, in the notes that go out. Um, but uh, for our specific case chair this month, uh, we do have uh, Maria Soder from the SAMI Center on. So Maria, I'm gonna turn the time over to you. Well, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I just feel so honored um, and happy to be here with all of you guys. Um, oh, thanks for putting our little logo up there. Um, so I would like to just tell you um, really, a little bit more in depth about the Sammy Center, maybe just briefly about our story, how we came to be, who we are, what we do, and then really just want to be a resource for for this network. Um, would that does that sound okay, Athena? Yeah, that's great. I have about five or ten minutes. Is that right? Yep, that's just fine. Okay, perfect. Um, so basically, um, let's see here. I am um immigrant dot child of parents that immigrated from Italy. I, bo I was born and raised and lived in Utah all my life. And I started my career in early childhood, um, you know, psychology, human development, um, probably 25 years ago, and actually helped open the first homeless um, preschool in Utah. So that's kind of exciting. Um, never in a million years would I expect to have come full circle. And now I'm here, you know, um, opening my own nonprofit, but that's just how life, how life goes. So anyway, that was an amazing um, and priceless experience. Um, I was able to do that for many years, stay home and raise my family for about 10 years, my, my daughters. Um, and then recent, and then went, went back to work when I was working for Head Start as a special need, needs liaison, I really saw a gap in the system. Head Start's amazing, love it, greatest experience ever. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that experience. Um, but here was the deal, um, everyone. What I was seeing as a special needs um, liaison is if a child had a diagnosis, um, they would get extra supports oftentimes. Um, you know, therapies, specialists coming in, working with a child, what have you. The children that didn't have a, a diagnosis oftentimes would fall through the cracks. And those are the kids that really... Um, you know, really, I couldn't sleep at night, you know, I was like, what, what is going on? And so oh, sadly, um, as, as many of you know, early intervention is vital. And if those children get the, didn't get the supports that they need, and they would go on, they head start was three, four and five years old, would go on to elementary. Um, oftentimes that child would be um, labeled as behaviors or troubled or naughty or all the things and never got the support they needed. So oftentimes would be expelled. Um, again, many of you know the research, you know, preschool to, to prison pipeline. I mean, there's just so many variables that were constantly going through my mind. And so um, when I heard Dr. Doug Goldsmith, the um, CEO at the time of the, of the Children's Center, speaking on behalf of the early childhood mental health crisis that was um, currently uh, happening in 2019, I kind of got the ball rolling in my head thinking, I think I'm... I think I want to do more, you know, in this area. And I started collecting research and data and like, is there a need for a social emotional preschool, you know, and, and that's what we are and that's who we are. So I did start the school. Um, I started the board in the night in 2019, I quit head start uh, with the support of my family and um, started pressing forward to, to create a school environment for children that didn't necessarily have a diagnosis, but had super big feelings and weren't always successful in a, in a typical preschool environment. Um, our website, the sammycenter.com goes into great detail um, about, about more about this and I'm limited on time, so I won't get into all that, but something else I want to share um, during all this time. And while I was creating the, the board and the school and everything, I kind of had my own epiphany um, crazy, but when my daughter at the time, uh, Theodora, she's 21 now, when Theodora was four, I had my second child, which was Sammy. And Sammy um, passed away. And um, it's crazy how I didn't realize all of the adverse childhood experiences my own family, my own daughter was experiencing. Um, I was just kind of, I think, numb and oblivious to my own grief and my own 
pain and just wanting to keep her happy. And she wasn't happy. You know, she had to, she had to say goodbye to her infant brother. I mean, that's, that's just tragic. And um, in that her trauma showed up in different ways. And we all, we know a lot of us in this field, if we don't deal with our things, they're, you know, they're there, they're going to come up. So anyway, um, uh, so that's kind of the other part of the, of my story. So that's where the Sammy Center, the name came to be. Um, we have been operating now for 19 months. We are full. We are a very small school. And the, so what's unique about the Sammy Center is we are the model that we are that we are um, developing is and why it's successful is because it's a small environment. These children, every child deserves this the right to be able to be in a learning environment where they are seen, soothed, secure, and safe. And that's what they get at the Sammy Center. Um, there are never more than 12 children. We have never less than three, four, sometimes five specialists um, that involve that in, entail um, or that in, that encompass uh, teachers with master's degrees, RBTs, speech therapist, um, social worker, mental health worker, teachers, you know, teachers that um, generic, you know, general general ed teachers. Um, not all the children at the Sammy Center have experienced adverse childhood experiences. Um, we have neuro, neurotypical, neurodivergent, and everything in between. Um, we have children that um, maybe don't come to us with the diagnosis, but through psychological evaluations and um, referrals, it's determined, okay, there is a diagnosis here. It's still the same. We still work with every child and meet them right where they are. It doesn't matter what the, what the diagnosis is. Um, I like to say that sometimes the Sammy Center may be a place in between, maybe there be a child is being asked to leave a, a, a typical preschool environment because their behaviors. And so they come to the Sammy Center. The majority of the time we are successful and the child is able to remain there until they graduate, until they turn five. But sometimes it is beyond our scope. And that's when I have amazing community partners like the Children's Center and um, HMHI and other programs where if a referral is, is necessary, um, we'll, we'll make that referral, but we always want to do what we can to, to, to work with every child. Um, it's crazy because a lot of the children that come to our program um, because of expulsion from another program, we don't see the behaviors in our school because of the environment. Uh, the environment is small. Like I said, we have a lot of one-on-one -on -one supports. Um, so yeah, we, we do social emotional curricula all day long. Um, we follow many different curricula. Uh, Montessori, Noni, um, Second Step, Teaching Strategies. There's many different, you know, things that we pull from. Um, everyone and anyone is welcome to come for a tour. Um, I love to show off our little school. I'm very proud of it. Um, it's a little cottage in Mill Creek on uh, 1515 East and 3300 South. Um, I'm always doing tours. I'm always looking for enrollment. So if anyone out there knows a three, four, or five-year-old, who has big feelings or just wants to be in a very nurturing environment, um, please, um, you know, send them my way. Um, the Sammy center at gmail.com is a, you can reach me via email um, or, you know, just look us up on the, on the web, the Sammy center.com. And like I said, we are hoping to expand. Um, I'm hoping to expand maybe somewhere near uh, primary children's hospital because it's near and dear to me, working with those children, preschool children who may have a, an infant, a sibling in the NICU. Uh, that's because of my my personal connection, but I'm also wanting to work with the refugee families, um, you know, low-income families, high-income families. We, we just have a whole spectrum. So um, that's who I am, who we are, and uh, I'm very, very proud of our little school. Um, we do have an event coming up. It's a, so we're a nonprofit. So I'm always, you know, working with um, trying to get grants and with the legislature. And as you know, some of you may know, we lost a huge grant, the stabilization grant was a soft money from COVID. So that's been really hard. And a lot of programs have had to close their doors. Um, thank, thank goodness we're doing okay. But we are having a really cool uh, fundraiser. It's a wreath event. So we're going to make this beautiful, um, very rustic wreath um and have like a little fun social evening there's going to be charcuteries and all this kind of stuff um at a local um, yoga studio in in holiday and then the the funds and the the proceeds will go to helping um 
a scholarship for a child who cannot afford the SAMI Center. So um, I can maybe even upload my flyer, or pass it along um, later, but that's it. Um, does anyone have any questions? There was a comment um, in the chat that from Colleen that just said, Carrie, and I got to see the center. Maria's an amazing, doing a phenomenal job, so. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I would love to invite anyone in for a tour anytime. So thanks so much for this opportunity. I love being a part of this network. Um, if there's anything ever I can do, please let me know. And um, like I said, please send, send any referrals our way. Thanks so much for this time. Great, thank you, Maria. All right, I'm also um, today gonna turn just a little bit of time over to Eric to introduce um, a new, uh, some new team members and a project that they are just initiating. Good morning, I am really excited. I uh, hope we're not getting reverb off of this owl in the room, but I'm really excited this morning to um, introduce uh, some new team members who are just onboarding with us this week. Uh, we've taken on a new project here at Integrated Services Program uh, through some Office of uh, Refugee Services money through the Department of Workforce Services. We are going to be providing early childhood care coordination to um, an Afghan refugee population that came into the country about 18 months ago. So we've started off with hiring two care coordinators and an epidemiologist um, to begin this work. And uh, I would like to introduce um, to my left, um, Blessing Boateng. So I don't know if the camera's gonna pivot or swivel or do anything. So I might just be doing hand puppet gestures here. At the end of the table, I have Liz Bagley. So those are our two care coordinators and our epidemiologist is uh, Karen Ellis. So uh, we uh, will have them coming to these meetings as well. We feel like it's invaluable to you. Uh, be part of this learning community and this group of peers and the ability to share resources and um, community services that are available. Um, this group, uh, it's very specific. Again, we've never in integrated services uh, been tasked with working with a very specific population. In this case, it's zero to five um, children uh, from our Afghan refugee population. And uh, we'll be connecting these children with uh, support services and specialists that will help to prepare these kids for kindergarten. We also want to ensure that they're connected with primary care uh, providers in the community and just want to ensure that uh, emotional and uh, uh, behavioral health, well being, everything is taken care of in the household. So our care coordinators will be doing screening and uh, connecting these families with these supports and services. So we're really excited about this project and we will keep you posted once we get everybody through the process that is State of Utah onboarding. And we hope that we'll kind of be out in the field and um, seeing families probably, I'd say by uh, hopefully middle of December, if not first of the year. Great. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, do you know what the main languages are that you need materials in? Just curious. So uh, the, it's the the main um, the main language that um, the Department of Workforce Services told us that ninety percent of the country speaks um, Pashto, ten percent Dari, and um, so those are the two kind of um, dialects. That we're we're looking at, um, looking at. I was just checking to see if we have that trans the Google Translate for those languages on the medical home portal. But if you can pop those in the chat, how they're spelled, that would be helpful for me. Put that in the chat right now. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, if um, does anybody else have any uh other brainstorming ideas that have come to mind or? Our thoughts before we move on to our our main presentation. All right. Well, we're super excited today to have a presentation all around motivational interviewing, um, with a specific emphasis on on how to apply this in diverse communities. And so um, we are have our have been so graciously. Um, 
have time from Dr. Grant Sonata, who's the director and, and health officer of San Juan Public Health with us today, and, and a panelist of community health workers um, that are going to teach us all about this. We're really excited. Um, so I'm going to turn the time over to Grant and have him introduce um, his panelists as well. Thanks, Athena. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. We would invite you while I get ready to share screen here, if possible, turn on your cameras. It's something that, that we really um, feed off of to see your faces and to have this be hopefully more of a dialogue. Let's see, and pardon me while I just click a button here. Hopefully this works. And then of course my things change, right? So just a minute, I wanna see more of you and reopen the chat. And uh, emojis are welcome. Try them out. <laughs> so um, let's get started here. Let's see, let me make sure I can click this slideshow button. I might be jumping in and out of this slideshow. Might stop sharing screen. Just see, look, Kathy, thank you for the heart, right? So we'll do a little introductions here. Um, I have some slides. I put them in the chat in case you want to reference them. Our main goal is to have more of a panel discussion. So we'll touch on a few things to kind of get us started and then go from there, as well as have a little bit of a, a mindfulness moment. So here's the flow that we put together. Uh, Valentine, Kathy, Jeanette, and I uh, will give, I'll give an introduction to them in just a minute. That's this, this building connections between us and you all. Um, a little bit to, of a chance to get to know each other. I put this little phrase together here that will want to nourish our minds and hearts. Uh, you all want to understand kind of your role as uh, early childhood care coordinators, other things like that. And with this idea of how can we culturally tailor motivational interviewing principles and skills. Um, so some things we put together for that, focusing on partnership and empathy as a foundation and how that can work across various aspects of what we might call culture. And then moving towards how do we find that connection that stimulates the client to action? And this was Jeanette's phrase here. And, and along the way, maybe we'll share some evidence for these approaches too. So that's our outline. I wanted to build these connections. One of our analogies that we use is ice cream cones and other desserts when we think about culture the cone being the base and all the scoops providing flavor and maybe some toppings. So for our uh, community health workers, also called community wellness coaches, we'll explain that a little bit more soon. But Jeanette, thanks so much for being here. Jeanette Vialta, um, Alliance Community Services, been in Salt Lake area for around 25 years now, right? Originally from Guatemala and really just if you haven't heard or gotten to know community health workers before, our group here are some of our champion CHWs. Um, Jeanette, you know, any CHW might have various professional backgrounds. Some might be a lay health worker coming just from the community. Jeanette has a business background in uh, Guatemala, also helped with case, uh, case management and health coaching. Um, Kathy, Ms. Kathy Wolfsfeld, coach in many different ways, right, Kathy? So, I mean, you didn't put it here, but there is some sports coaching too, right? Is it volleyball? I think there may be a couple other sports too, but definitely volleyball, right? Volleyball and basketball. That's nice. Thank you, Kathy. So Kathy's member of the Calvary Baptist Church, uh, historically black congregation in uh, Utah, the lar largest one historically and um, has a passion for helping, um, especially women with high blood pressure, with diabetes prevention and control, and just someone who's really knit into the community. Uh, one of the choir members too, right, Kathy? So, and then um, last but not least, Valentin Mukundente. Um, each, each one of you have such a history, Valentin, uh, originally from Rwanda, but her family was moved to a refugee camp in Zambia for high school. And when we talk about how many skills and languages and all of this, right, Valentine definitely comes to mind. 
it might come up how many languages you speak right here, but at least here we say, you know, you, you share that you're, you're a translator for United Nations High Commission for Refugees while you're waiting for relocation to America, also learned French and Swahili. And so uh, leader of Best of Africa organization that supports refugees and other African immigrants in our area. So there's, there's our group and what brings them together as for, for our presentation today is this community wellness coaching project that we had. <clears throat> so uh, this was um, primarily funded by the Office on Women's Health. Oh, what was our years for this, right? It was about uh, 2010 to 2018 about. And this, we were trying to be holistic with the seven domains of health. Uh, the coaching was based on motivational interviewing. It's not pure MI, so not but it has these same concepts and principles that we'll be sharing today. Um, so we'll go into more detail there. Uh, let's see, and my brief introduction, share a little personal photo here. Um, I have this little phrase here that I've been playing with that I try to dance with partners and the music. It's not about dancing around anything, right? And this is, I bring this up, right? Because motivational interviewing is about dancing with your client, not wrestling with your client. Sometimes it feels that way, right? And how do we shift? How do we shift and find that groove together? And so for me, it's about leading with intention, but that leading is not forceful. It's in response to, it's in communication with the follow using social dancing terms. And Athena, I know this is something in your background too. I don't know if it's been lately though. So I'll end with this phrase of co-creating emotive art. It's very much for me about the emotional aspect and connecting in that way. So this is my wife and I doing a little uh, black American dance here, Lindy Hop, otherwise called swing dancing. You might see that we are not synchronized. We're not doing exactly the same thing, but we're actually still dancing together. And so that's part of my symbolism today. Um, and also multitasking, right? We've got the kid there <laughs> keeping an eye on him or he's keeping an eye on us. So um, part of what we are sharing here was my dissertation. And it was, so it's, you know, this immense sense of gratitude to the community health workers that enabled me to develop my skills and hopefully contribute back more to the community because of that, that experience. So it's not just about the PhD. It's like this uh, heartfelt PhD, if you know what I mean. So we'd like to know in the chat here, who is here? Could you put um, your role, organization, and maybe something like region or city or something like that in the chat real quick, please? Because I know we've got about 30 total of us here together. And we'll see, because I'm expecting kind of this mix across the state, right? And thanks for the introduction, Maria. It was good to hear about the Sammy Center in Mill Creek. Nice. I wonder, I didn't quite hear where it was. So thanks for that. Yeah, please put it in the chat. And if those of you are in a room, you might have to unmute real quick, but are generally working for the state. Is that, oh yeah, we heard those introductions. Sorry about that. All right. We got care manager at the U in Farmington. Thanks. Care coordinator. Thanks, Athena. Davis County. Nice. Let's see, Pediatrics, Saratoga Springs, nice. And let's see, Northern Utah Plus, Care Coordinator, thanks. Awesome, Utah Valley Peds, awesome. Okay, Wasatch Pediatrics, Summit Office, awesome. Okay, we've got uh, Clinical Services Bureau Manager, thanks Haley, awesome. Ah, nice, uh, looks like Tri-County. RN Care Coordinator. Thanks, Erica. Awesome. Good mix here across the state. Central. Nice. Kendra. Awesome. Uh, Eileen. And we've got North in Utah. Cool. And also Main Utah Hospital. Awesome. Ah, transitions. Nice with primaries. Thanks. That's really crucial. And Integrated Services Transition Coordinator as well. Thanks. Appreciate the introductions here. Wish we could have more of an intimate atmosphere, but we'll do our best, right? Ah, Shriners, nice. Close to my heart there, thank you. Had a neighbor who went through some procedures there. Also, could you put a number in the chat on a scale of one to five, just your experience with motivational interviewing? Oh, just hearing it today as being a one, 
or some on five, hey, something like over five years of practice. Um, just hearing it today, awesome. Got kind of in the middle. Awesome, Maria, thanks. Okay, we've got a little bit of the ones, threes, threes, four. Yep, nice. I know, to say you're an expert in MI, right? I feel like it's a journey. I'm definitely not an expert per se. It's just something, I have some components that I'm good at, right? <laughs> Thanks for this. This is good mix. Awesome, appreciate. Hey, if you're just getting started, that's awesome too. So hopefully my general introduction that I've said so far gets, gives you the idea. It is a behavior evidence-based behavior change technique, um, but it's not about forcing, it's not imposing, it's trying to fight, figure out where the person is and help them move along. So to help us, I recognize we don't have a lot of time here, but I'd like you to visualize, nestle in here, take a couple intentional breaths and visualize a time when you were with someone who is somehow substantially different from you, but you finally felt connected. Maybe there was some kind of aha moment. And again, take a moment here, take a breath. Maybe there's some kind of aha moment that helped you understand where they were coming from. Maybe you figured out how to put yourself in their shoes where you're like, oh, these shoes were different, but now I finally started to get it. Something about their unique experience, you can finally understand it a little more accurately. Try to visualize that time. What did it feel like to have that type of aha moment that finally connecting with them? See if you can even capture an emotion that comes to mind or that you feel when you think of that experience or that memory. Could you put that memory, that, that word, that key word in the chat? Maybe it's an emotion, something like that. Did something come to mind? Relief. Very cool, Kim. Thank you. Others. Curiosity. Liberation. Thank you, Maria. Wow joy, empathy, yes. Eric, thanks, humbled. And Eric, you might be voicing for someone in your room too. I appreciate you being a scribe. Humbled, awesome, right? Wow, it, it is like this sense of uh, 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 just so special, so almost sacred that we can be in that space and understand someone more, valued, connection. Keep going there, I'll, I'll just keep going. Feel free to put that in the chat. I'll uh, share a little inspiration from Mr. Rogers here. Knowing, this is his quote, knowing that we can be loved exactly as we are gives us all the best opportunity for growing into the healthiest of people. Here we have him showing that by example with Officer Clemens at a time when swimming pools were segregated and, and it was black and white. And, uh, and so he showed on national TV that we can do this. We can come together, right? Make that connection. Thanks for adding here, Ingrid. Grateful and val um, validated. So oop, let's see. I'd like our community health workers to talk a little bit about what we, um, in, in motivational interviewing, they talk about partnership and empathy being a foundation. How can we do anything else around behavior change if we don't have this foundation first? And hey, who would like to go first, right? Kathy and Jeanette Valentin. What comes to mind for you in your work and your approach to working with clients when it comes to partnership and empathy? I'll go first. You know, first, um, I believe you need to meet people where they are. You know, wherever they are in life. And you first have to address their, their barriers. You know, what is keeping them from doing what it is that they want to do or the goals that they want to achieve? And so, you know, if we if we try to help someone, say, um, in a diabetes program, and they have this issue that they are in a food desert, and so it's very hard for them to get the healthy foods that they need. And so you need to meet them where they are and understand that this is a barrier for them. And so then we work with how can we get them healthy foods? You know, joining a co-op or something like that that they could, you know, get food delivered to their house if they're in a rural area. 
Um, and it's just putting them, putting yourself in their shoes. How would you like to be helped in this situation? How would you, what resources are you looking for to get what you need? And so that's how I would approach people in trying to help them, putting myself into their shoes and giving them the services that I would desire to have and nothing less. Thanks, Kathy. Jeanette. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Um, for me, I think the motivational interview as a community health worker um, is something that we use every day with uh, the people that we work with. Uh, for us in my uh, personal, for me, it's very important to know the background, the background of the person. You know, feelings are universal. I try to connect by feelings, maybe not by experiences, because sometimes we uh, not precisely have the same experiences, uh, but emotions, right? Emotion, what they are feeling at that time, uh, when I feel like that, how I react, right? And connect with the feelings with the, the person. Uh, and that is going to help me to understand a little bit better the situation, knowing the background, where are they coming from? Why are they doing um, what they doing? Uh, language is very important. Uh, understand the culture. I know sometimes it could be challenging, uh, but if when you have a client and you take a moment to do a little research about, you know, if you have someone, for example, from Colombia, right? Five minutes of research now in the computer and the phone, you know what they like, maybe something that you can connect with. Food is an, something universal and find that thing that is going to connect you with the people and then try to gain the trust of the person that you're working with. Um, you know, concepts are very different here. Um, and in Spanish, my first language is Spanish. The concept in English and in Spanish, sometimes it can be misunderstood. That's why it's so important to, to ask what they are understanding. What are you, you know, make them talk about what you are telling them and what they are understanding. Um it's important what they know uh, at this moment. For example, when we talk about um, um, nutrition, right? What they know about nutrition? What is the concept that they have about nutrition? What is the changes that they want to do? Or why is it, why is it so important to do those changes? Uh, what is the benefit? What will we happen if they don't do certain things, right? You know, have that conversation, but it's like... Uh, give them the power, you know, empower them to take their own decisions and uh, for them to explore what could be the benefit if I do this. For me, it's very important to give the, the power to the client to take their own decisions. I don't want to take the decision for them, but I want to, uh, I want them to realize the benefit if they do this change, how they're going to be benefited, how the family is going to be involved you know, trying to get that connection with, with a client. Um, so for me, what worked um, during this project is uh, I was willing to recognize things I might not know well, that I might not be an expert in. Although I was a community health worker, However, I realize that there might be things that um, I don't have many skills about. For example, um, I had young women in, a, in the project uh, who are from uh, a younger generation, and I was willing to listen to them, keeping in mind that things, our ways of thinking might be different. And... Uh, so I was willing to listen and see what works for them. I, I get that uh, from being a mother. Sometimes when I talk to my kids 
who are uh, from a young generation, I could see that maybe I'm being too hard to them. Uh, and then, so I realized that we are from different generations. We, we, we understand things different. And that's when I open my mind and be willing to listen and uh, meet in the middle. Thank you. Thanks, you three. Good start here. And as as we move along here, you know, if we, I know we don't have a lot of time, but if you have questions or ideas that come up to share or to ask our community health workers, please do. I know you have a lot of experience, a lot of complex situations you're you're working with in terms of the families you're trying to support, et cetera. So let's see. So, you know, They've, uh, Jeanette, for example, you talked about how emotions can be a common ground, food, things like that. What are those shared values to help us, first of all, recognize there might be a power difference or an empathy gap, and how do we bridge those? Valentin mentioning generation, that's a powerful difference, right, that, that we're all trying to navigate in different ways. Um, and so sometimes we can look, get overwhelmed by something like this wheel here, like, oh, look at all the differences we have. And I find some assurance that someone that's so experienced with this, so um, so talented at this, like Jeanette, she says, hey, this is how we can find that common ground and then navigate the differences from there. That's kind of a foundation. <clears throat> Another approach or um, framework that, I've, that we found to be helpful is cultural humility. Um, you've heard the CHW is touching on this already. You know, one lifelong learning, always recognize there's something to learn. Uh, Valentine, you had mentioned that, you know, always something to learn. Here we have a photo, you know, how can we recognize there's a power difference? Someone maybe with resources and someone with less resources. How can we recognize and mitigate that? And, you know, in addition to doing a little research about where someone's from, can we create those partnerships in the community? I hear that already in the beginning of the meeting with the uh, Afghan and refugee or immigrant community, for example. You know, who is it that's a recognized stakeholder in those communities? Uh, you know, is it a, a faith or a traditional leader, uh, maybe a shaman, someone like that? Or is it someone that's uh, a, well, a community health worker just without that title? Another title for CHW is a natural helper someone who you just can't stop them from helping, right? <laughs> Gabby, you smile, right? This is such, and many of you are that way, right? So you, we, we can all have that heart of a CHW and tapping in, finding those people, they're already trying, they're already trying to figure out how to navigate these food deserts, et cetera. How can we find them, recognize their expertise and create those partnerships? Does this prompt any thoughts you wanna comment on? Kathy, Jeanette, Valentin. Yeah, I was listening what you were saying about um, that self-reflection. Sometimes we want people to do things, right? Because we know this health is the best way for them because of the health, for example. But uh, Valentine was saying something very important. What are their beliefs? You know, what is the culture? Uh, I remember that I have a case uh, where I interpreted for this family at the hospital and the kid has been uh, with um, fever for three days or four, something like that. And um, when the doctor asked why you didn't bring the kid before and what do you do with, with him? Um, this lady said, oh, I put an egg in their tummy with uh, something. And the doctor gets so mad and say, no, you, have, you know, you have to bring the kid before you cannot do those practices. And, and one of the first thing is validation. Uh, Ingrid was saying in the chat validation, you know, the validation is very important because it is a moment um, where this woman feel totally um, uh, sad because now she realizes she's doing something bad for the kid, but that was what she learned from their culture, from their background, you know, and validation will be a, a big technique there saying, oh, okay, that practice that you did in your culture uh, 
maybe it's not very helpful right now. You know, it's a moment for explaining. And I thought at that moment, because as interpreter, you cannot get into the middle, but right. But I learned that it could be a good moment, a teachable moment for both, you know, for the doctor and for uh, for her as well. But um, those are something that it could be misunderstanding because, you know, if the doctor could call DCFS, another thing is going to happen to this family. And it's not like this family wants to hurt the kid, but it is the cultural practices. And that's why I say it's so important to know the background, to know what is the cultural practices and invite the people to, you know, this is uh, another way, right? This is another way, um, not telling them that that's dumb or something like that, but, you know, bring that knowledge to the family and and, and use that as another tool that they can use. And um, yeah, that's, that's why it's so important, like, what Valentine was saying and Ingrid, the validation and knowing their cultural practices. Mm -hmm. I had a um, a little prick of my consciousness with the power differences. You know, the power differences between clinician and patient or parent child or, you know, boss and employee, however, you know, whatever, aspect that you live in but you know when when we go to the doctor we think that the doctor is so much higher above an in intelligence you know they went to school all these years for a reason so we're going to do whatever you say to do we trust your education um and so you have a lot of power over our lives over you know what we put in our bodies what we do with our bodies what you know and i found that sometimes that power can be abused and you know we get looked down upon for not being as intelligent or not understanding the directions or you know and and so that power difference is is really big especially in the medical field. And so that's where humility comes in, where you try to understand where that person is coming from, what their barriers are. Like Jeanette said, if they have you know, cultural differences that you just don't know, try to understand what these differences are. And so when you have community health workers working along with you in your team, all of these things can be addressed in such a way that is not harmful to the patient and it's not de degrading or dehumanizing of them. And so it's it's that power struggle. You have to be very careful of the line that you walk because we do believe and we trust what you tell us. And so, you know, taking advantage of that and making us feel less than you know, and speaking in in ways that we don't understand or the verbiage that you use is is too academic for the patient or whatever. There's that difference that needs to be um, needs to be more balanced. Mm -hmm. And that's my that's my deal on power struggle and power differences. The struggle is real. Mm -hmm. Well said, and I'm glad you named it the harm there, right? It actually is harmful when someone is demeaning to someone's core beliefs or their their traditional values or things like that. And so I'm glad you named it that way. And I, it brings to mind one example among my staff. We have uh, some community health workers who are Native American um, and uh, want to share this carefully because I don't want to throw, you know, like a, a school staff member under the bus or something. But um, there was a, a case where they were invited to come help uh, with um, a family who was Native and with a school IEP meeting. And my understanding is that it was initially the new IEP was uh, presented as just, okay, need the parent to sign it, we'll move forward. But 
because the community health workers are there, they were asking questions like, oh, help us help help her understand what does this mean? What's it for? What's the process? And eventually it came to light that one of our community health workers is also a former principal. And the tone just shifted in the room where suddenly they, the school staff realized like, oh, this is not just a community health worker, right? And it's one of those things. We exercise power in different ways. We don't realize it, right? And really, should we treat each other any differently based on our titles or things like that, right? We all have different forms of experience and expertise and how can we value those? Um, and thankfully they were able to navigate that together and come to a, a more positive place. Um, the school staff even contacted our CHWs later and thanked them for really creating a productive uh, experience for the family. So that's just one recent example that comes to mind. Anything else? Valentine, did you want to jump in yet for this one? No, right. what, what I wanted to add is um, more often I get asked, uh, why do you think it's important to have uh, community health workers who are from that, that community instead of somebody from somewhere else? Um, first of all, I believe in the power of uh, having being represented with somebody who looks like you because for for those of us who who come from segregation and racism and where for so many years we were told that we are not able to do this and achieve this so that's really powerful for us to see somebody who look like us being able to to be successful and and achieve uh, something big. So when we have community health workers who are from those communities, uh, it's also uh, building capacity for those communities, uh, showing our community members that yes, you can do this. Somebody who looks like you can can do this, and uh, it, it goes to the point, uh, Dr. Sunad, you you talk about value the community. Uh, that that's that's realizing the cultural expertise in in that community and the 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 power and the way for them to to build their capacity awesome maybe i'll mention one structural shift that's happening in the last couple of years some of you might know that there's a chw certification our team here has been part of that process and really creating that creating curricula for that and you might think, oh, why do we need a certification, right? Similar to what Valentin's saying, why? What? We get asked this a lot. And because we already have people like you all helping naturally, right? For example, Daniela, appreciate you chiming in the, in the chat there, right? Uh, some are in the system. Thankfully, there's there are increasingly more opportunities, but we still need this, right? And to have that certification, it's actually allowing us to negotiate with Medicaid, for example, with systems to say, can we compensate for the time? They're not just a volunteer. They're not just a big hearted person, right? This is something we need consistently. So it's really allowed for that power difference to happen on a systems level. So just want to chime in on that. Um, in addition to the, you know, the interpersonal level too, right? And it just goes back to this slogan, right, around nothing about us without us is truly for us. So how can we have that engagement at every level of our program development, right, things like that. Um, let's see, what's helpful from the group here? Because we could um, dive into some specifics around empathy, for example, um, as well as some specific MI skills around, you know, affirming, emphasizing autonomy. Um, if you don't mind, put in the chat if there is something in particular you're wanting to maybe ask about. Um, and I'll, I, we have, you can see here, there's some, we can dig a little deeper into empathy as well. So if you don't mind, put something in the chat if there is something kind of a burning question or a topic or maybe a, a scenario that you're dealing with, um, trying to navigate. I'll pause for just a moment in case you have something and feel free to unmute if you'd like. Think about that, put it in the chat. How about we, we dive in a little bit more? We've talked about empathy, right? We led with that. Um, 
Kathy, right? I, I think of you when we were talking about this on Monday during our preparation. Like this is something intuitive to a lot of you. Um, motivational interviewing does help us convey that empathy, right? We might feel it, but how do we express it? Um, sorry, I'll go back a slide real quick. I do appreciate some tools here. I'll point you to this. Some of you may have done some trainings where you've gotten had, sorry, clicking too much here. There's a little lag. There we go. Um, I realize this link is, is broken now. <laughs> On I think my last slide, I fixed it. But um, if you just Google MITI, motivational interviewing, it'll come up with this MITI42. By the way, one of the best acronyms, MITI, MITI. So um, uh, do the little raise hand emoji or something if you've, you've had your uh, motivational interviewing evaluated. This is one of the ways they have tried to evaluate empathy. Um, like, how do you measure empathy? This is challenging, right? This is challenging. So this is just one approach. There are some others. And I'll just mention here, you know, just not giving attention to the client's pers perspective, right? That happens. Sometimes we're super busy. Go down the checklist, right? In the middle, trying to understand client's perspective with some modest, modest success. And the part that really stands out to me here is that trying to show evidence of accurate understanding of the other person. Sometimes we're like, yeah, I get where they're coming from. We've had a shared experience, right? But do we understand it from their perspective? And that's the where we check, right? And really curious how you all might be doing that. And the last part I'll add here is that the highest level is when you read between the lines, you're sensing something that's not really said. And that's where I'll transition to this one. Like I said, Kathy, we had a little discussion about this, right? Naturally thinking about emotional empathy, there's also, how's what's their logic? What's their reasoning, right? Similar to what Jeanette was saying, like the treatment uh, using an egg, that, that part of that's the logic, right? Um, we even spent a little time talking about time. You know, some people it's like, if you're not on time, that's disrespectful, right? Other people it's like, hey, I've got how many kids trying to get them in the car, or on the bus, right? And that's that other type of empathy that you were talking about earlier, right? About food deserts, things like that. Can someone even show up on time? And can we understand it across generations as well as with historical events, similar to what Valentin, you were saying too, right? So there's my little um, intro to this multidimensional empathy. Is there anything you want to add? Because you've already talked quite a bit about it. What do you think? Yeah. Maybe just giving you some language here, things that you already understand intuitively, but also thinking, how can we institutionalize this empathy to show our clinic, our um, forms are really designed for the people we're trying to serve. So, nice. oh, and I'll just mention, as we work on being trauma-informed, something I've been trying to add to that is to highlight and really empathize with any resilience we see already, be it individual, historical, intergenerational, because the people are here. That means they've survived. We have survivors right here, probably some of you, right? That's resilience. And I think that's something we really need to highlight as we also empathize with the trauma, right? Kathy, does that trigger something for you? Well, you know, I'm I'm thinking about you know, the vaccination hesitancy in my, in my population, yep. you know, it has historical background that, you know, the trust is just not there. You know, we had, everyone remembers the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. You know, everyone remembers Henrietta Lacks and her cancer cells that were removed. And, you know, and so there's that, that lack of trust. We don't know what you're going to do with whatever it is that you're taking from us. And, you know, it's that, and so if you, you need to understand where we're coming from, why we're afraid, why we don't trust, why we're skeptical about, you know, these, these things that you want to put us through. And so as Valentine had stated earlier, we, we desire to have people that look like us or that at least are from the same area as we are, or have the same experiences that we have had, so that we can have a relationship and we can empathize with each other. 
So historically, that's very powerful in the African-American community. Powerful, well said. Thanks, Kathy. So um, just a slide here to highlight what Jeanette was saying as well, um, where emotions and our shared values, right, can be a common place for common ground. But sometimes we get overwhelmed by those differences, right? I'll mention here briefly one bit of um, research that I found to be, oops, sorry about the lag. Let's see. Oh, here's here's our community wellness coaching study, just so you can get a sense of um, what what we did with our 485 women. Um, and each was coached for about a year, and you can see kind of the mix. Um, let's see. I was trying to highlight one other slide again. I'm sorry about the lag here. It's just part of my computer having some issues. Just a few other resources for you. You can look at later measure some of these things. Um, even uh, we're trying to empower our community health workers with skills, again, to demonstrate empathy, things like that. Um, for example, one thing I'll highlight here is that we create an environment that's conducive to empathy, to uh, person-centered practices, right? If our work environment is not such, it's increasingly difficult to practice that with our clients um, or at the front desk, things like that. And so I want to highlight that it's not just a guarantee, right? That, that we're gonna be able to do this. Um, and so here where we saw, um, where, we, uh, where I listened to, this was limited sample, English speaking, stratified random sample out of those 485. But we took a look at these and two, measures stood out as related to retention in our program. That was empathy and the cultivating change talk. And that's a measure of being person-centered, uh, focused on the, the motivations of the person, right? So as we saw more of this or more of the empathy, people were more likely to just stay in the study, stay in the program. So that can be a goal, right? Part of it's like we said, not harming, but also creating that relationship and showing that, hey, we care. So that's one bit of evidence that we uh, came out of our study. And I'll just share, ooh, sorry about the lag. One other, just if you don't mind me being geeky for a minute here, this is the, where they were looking at statistics to say, why is it that motivational interviewing sometimes works? And when, uh, for example, a therapist uses MI consistently, they saw more change talk. Person's like, oh, I want to quit smoking or something like that, right? But that alone wasn't related to the outcomes. When the therapist wasn't using MI, then it was the opposite. Less of that change talk, more of the sustained talk. Yeah, I'll, I'm just gonna keep smoking. It's not bothering me that much, right? But the sustained talk was the, would have the opposite, right? More of that would say, oh, they're definitely gonna keep smoking, right? What, what came out of this though was the combination of Increasing the change talk and reducing the sustained talk is really what helped improve the outcomes. And so as the therapist is, is really, or you all, right, is nav helping with that dance. Oh, we're hearing a little bit of change talk. Let's grab onto that. And then there's that sustained talk, like shifting away from that. It's that dance that really does end up helping. So as um, a chance to wrap up, Maybe this question, Jeanette, you had talked about stimulating the client to action, finding that connection first. I put th this as helping discover that why so that we can get to the how. Is this something you want to comment on? But we can end on any other note, Kathy, Jeanette, Valentine. What do you think? As well as, well as any questions from the group. Yeah, I was uh, talking about that connection, right? Um but another thing that is very important in the motivational interview is the body language. Uh, because sometimes uh, you say, oh yeah, tell me, but you know, your body language is showing totally something different and, and you miss that opportunity to connect with the client. Um, that, that's why it's so important, the body language. And uh, we were talking about emotion. I always said emotions are universal language. Right when you find that connection, and remember that this 
person is a human being, is a mother, is a sister, is a grandmother, is a grandfather, is someone very special for someone else. If you take the moment to care, uh, you know, I know the the health system, you don't have much time. I, I understand that. But at least the minutes that you have, try to make it value, right? Like you care about this person and you pay your attention. Uh, you know, uh, we have a, a case where this person has diabetes and he was given this machine to uh, take the numbers at home. And every time that he's coming back to the a clinic, he always have the sugar levels high. And the CHW team, uh, we did a home visit. And what we figured out is that at home, he did, he used the machine, but he didn't know how to read it. He didn't know how to use it. And no one take the time to show him how to use the machine, how to interpret the numbers, how to do that. Right. And that, that's why it's so important. I know that maybe you don't have that time in your team, but as Kathy was saying, that's why it's so value the CHW work because, you know, as a CHW, you have more um, flexibility to talk about with a client, more, more time. And um, that's why we always advocate for CHWs in clinics because that's, um, it's not a competency with uh, nurses. We have that a lot, like it's not, it's totally different what the nurses does and what we do. Um, we are a team, we can work together for the well-being of the clients. Uh, one thing I can add is uh, also important to be aware of the background of the people you are working with. Uh, for example, in my community, we we are now struggling uh, with uh, many people who, with uh, diabetes and uh, other health issues related to uh, consuming a lot of sugar. And then we started wondering, why is this happening? So we realized that um, some of our uh, African refugees, when they get here, they consume a lot of sugar, like soda, all these sweet uh, drinks. And then we realized that um, for some reason, back home, those are expensive things, especially for those coming from refugee camp. It's not easy to afford uh soda so when they get here it's it becomes easier so they go to the store and buy as many sodas as possible and end up with uh, diabetes um, so having that in in the background helps us to know why there is a lot of uh, uh, sugar consumption in, in the community and then then you know how to to do the educational piece of it um, by helping them realize that back home, even if you consume sugar, but there is a lot of physical activities, you know, we walk a lot. Uh, we we spend uh, so much time uh, at the farm doing all these physical activities that helps us um, uh, get, uh, get less uh, diabetes and, and so on. But when we come here, it's a lot of driving, it's less walking. And uh, so having that education uh, of what, what the community is struggling with is helpful to provide education and prevent those health issues. What I would like to say, the one thing that we did not touch on with our motivational interviewing is that we helped the clients um, make smart goals. And so, you know, we would help them be specific and to be realistic and to have a time limit. And, you know, and so we would help them make smart goals, something that they could achieve on their own, something that they come up with on their own. And we would just help them say, you know, if they just started to exercise, they're not going to go out and run a 5k you know they're going to take it one step at a time and start walking first and so we're going to help them achieve these little step goals in order to achieve their big goal at the end 
So we help them with the SMART goals. That's what I wanted to add. That's all. Sorry, there's <laughs> a little delay on my career. Unmuting. Here, I'm just going to jump to a um, concluding slide and just really express uh, gratitude for all of you being coming together, just even hearing a little bit of your discussion and how much you care about the people you work with. And gratitude for Kathy, Jeanette, uh, Valentin for sharing here and and being engaged with the chat. Again, wish we had a little more cozy atmosphere, right? Really have some direct heart to heart, but I'll close with this quote from Maya Angelou. Um, hope it can help uh, you all uh, with your own self-care as well as with your clients uh, as they're navigating very complex and heavy things. I have great respect for the past. If you don't know where you're, you've come from, you don't know where you're going. I have respect for the past, but I'm a person of the moment. I'm here and I do my best to be completely centered at the place I'm at. Then I go forward to the next place. So again, thank you all. And hopefully we can stay in touch uh, if um, there's ways to collaborate. Thanks again. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Grant, um, Kathy, Jeanette, and Valentine. We're so appreciative of your words today and would love to be able to send out your slides too if you want to send those along to us to this group. Um, I think this is a really valuable discussion and a great reminder for uh, ways that we can better connect and practice cultural humility in our daily practice or our daily work. And so we're so grateful. You're welcome. I'm just gonna flip back to our closing slides here. Um, so we just wanna remind everyone that there, um, that you can stay connected between our meetings. Sorry, is everybody seeing pictures of themselves? <clears throat> um, okay, so to stay connected between our meetings, we do have our um, Utah Children's Care Coordination Network Facebook group, we'd love to have you join. You can share information on there about events, resources, also ask questions like, like the questions we had today. Hey, we're looking for rental assistance <clears throat> in this area. Does anybody know of any resources and do the sharing in between meetings? Or also anybody can email our listserv with questions and that will go out to the entire group as well. And then our next meeting is going to be on Wednesday, December 20th. And our meeting focus for that month is going to be all about transition to adulthood for children and youth with um, special health care needs. So we have uh, a lot of really great um, presenters lined up for that as well. We're really um, looking forward to another full meeting. So thank you, everyone. <clears throat> thank you. Oh, and if Daniela's here or others like her, encourage you to consider the CHW certification. Maybe you're, see if your employers are supportive of that. Um, it's really a, a great skill set to add to what you're doing. So, thanks. Um, oh, can I ask you a question? Oh, yeah. How do, you, how do you get that certification? Yeah. Ooh, Jeanette, are you still here? Yes. Yes. I mean, I know it's available down here in San Juan County, but I yeah, don't know. You know we, have the, we have the English and the Spanish classes. Um, if you go to the um, Utah Health Department um, website, you can find the CHW certification in English. If you have it in Spanish, that's the, uh, with the Utah State University. Um, and that is uh, in Spanish. Let me see if I have the information here. Oh, thanks so much. I will put it in the chat for the Spanish one. Oh, good. Um, I apologize. I need to sign off right now for another meeting, but that's a great And maybe, Athena, if you can share that with yep. the group. We'll, we'll find those links and send them out as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, good to catch up to Athena. Yes, yes. Good to see you. Diabetes days, right? Yes, I know. <laughs> hey, hope to talk more soon. See all, you all right. Bye.
Right. I think it's the, the number for the Spanish one. Okay. And her name, she is uh, Maria Jose. And that's her phone number. That's for the Spanish one. And if you want the English version, is in the um, Utah State Health Department website. You can find CHW and you're going to have all the information there, how to register. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Thank you. everyone. Bye. Bye.